Kia ora, Talofa, namaste, haere mai, and welcome to the Niche Cage Variety Show coming at you after a, another fantastic Aotearoa sporting weekend and just general week because the, the sport just comes any old time, especially with uh, the mayhem, the sporting mayhem and, and carnage we are dealing with wildcard. Beautiful things happen in the Aotearoa sporting beat. We discussed a lot of the Black Caps. We broke down their 03 series sweep loss to England. Just processing what happened on our Patreon podcast. Big up all the Patreon whānau. Patreon.com forward slash our niche cache. Greatest way to support the niche cache and all our content as well as extra cricketing podcasts at the moment. We might expand that out at some point in the future, but right now it's just a, a safe space to, to discuss Aotearoa cricket. And I think we can all benefit from a safe space, safe space to discuss Aotearoa cricket. Um, I'm so shook by discussing Aotearoa cricket, I can barely string a sentence together, but we tried our best. The Black Caps stunk, and we're processing it on our Patreon uh, podcast. Otherwise, Patreon's just a great way to support the Niche Cache and all our mahi, patreon.com forward slash our Niche Cache. Pick up the new email newsletter as well every Monday and Friday evening. That gets sent out. That includes extra Niche Cache yarns and content, as well as all the links to um, our website content, as well as all the podcast stuff as part of that email newsletter. So you can get off social media, just check your inbox twice a week, and it's just big, major, hectic, hearty, Aotearoa, niche cache content straight to your email inbox, and we're the niche cache. Deliver a uh, website, the niche-cache.com, where you can find fresh and funky Aotearoa sporting yarns, that are breakdown on the Aotearoa Kiwis, that are breakdown on the Aotearoa Kiwi Ferns. The Wildcards uh, recap the football Ferns first up loss to Norway. And there's plenty more coming over the next couple of days as well. So big up our, our website. That's the bread and butter, thenish-cache.com. We are here for the variety show. It is an Aotearoa sporting buffet. And we always start with a dose of mindfulness wildcard. I'm feeling extra zen right now and i'd like you to amplify that can you amplify um extra zenness or is it sort of like multiplying by zero you know is whatever you multiply by zero it's still zero um I'm not sure if you can amplify zenness well we've discussed this before about enlightenment as well and what is enlightenment and i think Amplified Zen and enlightenment and being enlightened is just moving towards peace. And so amplifying Zen is just more peace. And that's what it is. Don't get caught up in the, uh, <laughs> in the terminology here. Wildcard. We're just always working towards peace. And I think, um, I believe I am now I've hit enlightenment and I have ascended to a higher realm because now I'm just trying to focus on peace. How about that? Sorry to hijack your mindfulness, but I'm just trying, that's, to, that's trying to be pretty peaceful. Good. Um, that's pretty good. Amplify Zen would be a great band name as well. I, just, I have to keep that in mind. Um, uh, this is actually, this is, I think this actually does supply as some amplified Zen and peace. And like the, everything you just said, this uh, Thich Nhat Hanh quote that I've written down fits in really nicely. Um, one, two, three, four, five simple words. Smile, breathe, and go slowly. Smile, breathe, and go slowly. If that's not the pathway to peace, I, I don't know what it is, I, I gotta say. Also, also the pathway to a good podcast, because I've already stumbled over my words. So if I just smile, <laughs> take a breath and go slowly, we might uh, get a coherent sentence out. But I think that's also just a good um, dose of mindfulness for the old daily activities, the chop wood, carry water. Yep. If you can just smile take a breath and go slowly through any situation, you're going to be better off. And each one of those steps amplifies the Zen because each one of those steps, you're just working up the ladder towards peace. Woo. And 
whichever rung on that ladder you happen to be at, um, smile, breathe, and go slowly applies. Like you hear right at the top of the ladder, it applies. You right at the bottom of the ladder, it applies. That's one of those universal ones where no matter where you are on the journey, like um, also if you're trying to quantify where you are on a ladder of enlightenment, you're probably actually moving backwards rather than upwards because it's not a shouldn't be an achievement, right? It should be a um, the stripping of achievements. Um, achievements is just playing into the ego factor. But smile, breathe, go slowly. Just going to stop there because i was about to deliver up another fire uh mindfulness <laughs> sentence about peace but we need to crack into some aotearoa sport wild card and you're going to start us off you're going to serve up a little hot take to start the show about the uh half pakia half palangi brother mr sean marks boss man ting of the brooklyn nets curious to listen to what you're going to say about sean marks yeah old, old sean marks is um swinging his weight around a little bit at the moment in, in ways we haven't necessarily seen from him in the last couple of years. So um, last week, late last week, I published the quotable Stephen Adams piece, right? And um, that to me sort of signals the end of the NBA season, at least the end of my coverage of the season that's gone. Um, no doubt Steve-O is on holiday himself right now, probably, you know, milking the cows and then his coromandel farm as we speak. Um, but holidays for Steve coincidentally means the busiest time of the year for that other Kiwi fella in the NBA, Mr. Sean Marks. And he, yeah, he's got a, got a bit of a doozy on his hands right now. Um, and I don't know exactly how this is all going to turn out for him, but like, I just, you know, I just got to say full credit to Marksy for actually being a, a GM right about now, being doing his general managership. Um, I do have to edit this a little bit on the fly because in between P Patreon podcasts and, and um, variety show podcasts, I did scroll down the old Twitter and old mate Shams is reporting that Kyrie Irving has opted into his uh, player option for next season, um, wants to commit himself to the to the cause with Kevin Durant once again. Um, I don't necessarily know that that matters, though, in the thing. I think the point is that his hand was forced. Um, so despite Kyrie Irving announcing himself as co-owner and co-GM at the end of last season, um, Sean Marks pretty much stiffed him for a long-term deal, right? So Kyrie wanted like, you know, four years and uh, I don't know, 250 million bucks or whatever. Um, but for valid reasons, those reasons being that Kyrie Irving over the last, whatever, three years, I think he's been at the Brooklyn Nets, has missed more games than he has played and not all of them due to injury. Um, those are valid reasons why you might not want to commit that much money to a guy who you don't necessarily trust is going to be out there in a you know NBA playoffs environment when you need him most, um, which led to Kyrie Irving threatening to opt out of that last year and seek a sign and trade. The market wasn't really there for that, so it's not too surprising if he's truly chosen to to opt back into his um, final year contract. That doesn't mean he couldn't be traded. He could still be traded as an expiring contract now. Um, and who knows what this means for next year if they're not willing to give him a max um, contract or well, how much of a discount is Kyrie Irving willing to accept versus what he might be able to find elsewhere. I don't know. If he does leave, that could put Kevin Durant's status into question. It might not, but it also could. You know, those two are good bros. Um, you wouldn't want to lose Kevin Durant, but after the last couple of years, I, I think it shows a lot of cojones from um, from Sean Marks to, that he's willing to put cards on the table and say, we're prepared to take that risk um, as opposed to just doing everything that Kyrie Irving asked. Um, they still have Ben Simmons, still got Joe Harris, Patty Mills, Seth Curry, a few other guys. So like, um, I, I don't know what Kyrie Irving's trade value would be worth, probably not a whole lot, but they'd get gold back in return for KD if he was to leave. So he'd add a few more players in there. They were a playoff team before those two arrived as well, don't forget. So it's not like they'd be bottom, bottoming out or anything. Um, they haven't exactly lived up to the contender hype since uh, since Durant and Irving have been there either. Um, maybe Kyrie opting in means that everything's nice and patched up. Sean Marks has um, played the played the stiff hand and then gotten a result. Um Maybe it doesn't. <laughs> like maybe there's not happy families and this, they're going to be looking for trades or whatever come the start of free agency in a couple of days. I don't know. But I do know that I like seeing Sean Marks digging his feet in the sand and saying like, hold up here, fellas. I'm the boss, man. I make decisions. Um, we'll see how it works out for him. But I, I do like that from him. I think it's, that's some good work from Marksy. But uh, Aotearoa NBA influence as well. Stephen Adams, yeah. one of the most influential, you know, Memphis Grizzlies players. Sean Marks, influential GM. Aotearoa in the NBA, big up, big up. 
my uh, hot take to start a show wild card is that something is brewing with Aotearoa Rugby League. And this comes after a good win for the Kiwis, good win for the Kiwi Ferns. Kiwi Ferns, good result needs to be taken in context though because Tonga are not going to the Women's World Cup. So they're still building as a rugby league you know, wahine nation. Uh, the Tongan blokes were um, kind of blown away by the Kiwis, and I think there are good signs. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to go down the uh, Black Caps 3 0 series sweep over England take just yet, because I think these are very exciting times for Aotearoa Rugby League. So I'm just going to settle with something is brewing, and something is brewing in a World Cup year which obviously sets up an exciting World Cup phase for the men and women. I think both teams are going to be highly competitive and something is brewing. Something's also brewing just as far as the quality, quantity and spread and overall juice behind Rugby League in Aotearoa. And I'd just like to let it be known right now, something is brewing. Let me say it again. Something is brewing. There, at, in the next five years, you might start to see pieces put in place for an NRL team, another NRL team in Aotearoa. We know the Warriors are returning to Mount Smart. There's going to be NRL Wahine expansion as well, which just means more Kiwi uh, Wahine can play in the NRLW. That's going to be great. And let alone International Rugby League, let alone the number of Kiwi juniors currently already in NRL systems. And the whole package comes, comes together, and whether you are tapped in or not, just know that something is brewing with Aotearoa Rugby League. And the signs were well and truly on display last Saturday afternoon and evening with uh, how the Kiwis and Kiwi Ferns performed. The players that were used, the quality of players, the depth on show, all comes together for a uh, something is brewing situation. Statistical funkier wildcard. Really excited to hear some black cap stats. Yeah, something was brewing with the um, with the Kiwis and Kiwi ferns. Something was stagnating for the black caps, and it was their top. Um, just like. Simple as this, just roll through their top five. Um, Tom Latham in the series, 121 runs at an average of 20.16, top score of 76. Will Young, 133 runs at 22.16, top score of 56. Williamson, Kane Williamson, the captain, 96 runs at an average of 24 flat, a uh, high score of 48, didn't even get a 50. Devin Conway, 151 runs at 25.16, high score of 52. Henry Nichols, 59 runs at 14.75, high score of 30. Um, none of them averaged better than 25. Um, only three of them scored 15s, and none of them scored multiple 50s. They're your top five batsmen, the guys you're relying upon the most. That's not great. Um, just uh, just lucky that <laughs> lucky that they had Daryl Mitchell and Tom Blundell to come in afterwards, because Daryl Mitchell scored 538 runs, um, breaking all sorts of records in the process. There's Tom Blundell, 383 runs combined. That's 921 runs between Mitchell and Blundell. Literally everybody else for the Black Caps on this tour, 893 runs. So Mitchell and Blundell outscored the entire rest of the Black Caps team over three tests. Um, I could get into some bowling stuff as well, uh, looking at some RPOs in particular, um, which was slightly better than that top order batting, uh, though not by a whole lot with the exception of Trent Bolt. Um, but we're still in mourning after a series sweep, so I think I'll let the bowling stuff slide for now, and we'll just stick with that. Rather, um, yeah, stagnant uh, top water batting performance from the Black Caps. It wasn't good. I just caught myself doing a, uh, a stank face, and it wasn't like previous stank faces. It was like an actual, like, ooh, something stinks. <laughs> like a stank face, as opposed to, ooh, that's stanky. Um my stats here, wildcard, just on the back of the Kiwis' performance, just going to um, explore some ideas through stats from the Kiwis' game. The first of which, I've just uh, re-entered the, uh, the stats for that game, and Joey Manu's run meters are now at 401. So I think fresh after the game, they were at 396 or 398. 
then at the time of writing on Sunday morning, they had gone to 404 meters. Now it's back down to 401. So I guess it's 401. At least it's over 400 meters because that is absolutely ridiculous. And it's off 32 runs. So I didn't go as far as to do the math for runs or meters per run for every Kiwis player. All we need to know is that 10 meters per run of 32 runs is 320 meters and Joey Manu ran for 401 meters. So you're getting up into 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 meters per run, which is absolutely ridiculous. 12.53. 12.53. So every time he ran the ball, he averaged 12.53 meters. A rugby league defensive line is 10 meters away from the ruck. Yeah. <laughs> and he's right. He's averaging 12 meters per run. That's ridiculous. However, it's not, the numbers are ridiculous. Um, and Joey Manu is definitely ridiculous, but it's in tune with what the whole Kiwis team were doing as far as efficiency running the footy. And we go to efficiency because the Kiwis had 58% possession. So that means that the Kiwis are going to have bigger numbers than Tonga automatically because they have more footy. So they have more opportunity to run. So they have more opportunity to get run meters. And this is evident in Joey Manu, 32 runs, 112 post-contact meters. Jason Talmalolo had 45 post-contact meters. And Joey Manu had more post-contact meters than Talmalolo and Adam Fanua Blake combined. However, that stems from having more footy. 58% position. But the thing about the Kiwis that I really loved was how efficient they were when running the footy. And basically, most of their players averaged over 10 meters per run. Jordan Rapiner, 18 runs for 204 meters. Dylan Brown, 8 runs, 94 meters. Jerome Hughes, 11 runs, 132 meters. Jesse Bromwich, 8 runs, 88 meters. Brandon Smith, six runs, 76 meters. Fisher Harris had a nice break down the middle of the field, running it straight off a Joey Manu pass. So he got a few extra meters, 11 runs, 163 meters. Isaiah Papali'i wasn't as destructive as he always is for the Parramatta Eels. Still averaged 10 meters per run, nine runs, 90 meters. Kenny Bromwich, some people don't even know Kenny Bromwich is on the field. Other people know he's doing absolutely everything. 11 runs, 115 meters. Joey Tarpany, 16 runs, 162 meters. All these dudes averaging over 10 meters per run, um, let alone Peter Hiku, Maratini Okore, Ronaldo Molotalo, all those dudes were very strong as well, like literally a smidge below the 10 meter per run marker. The key thing here, and something I'm learning about rugby league in 2022, is the need to be direct. And Jerome Hughes, if he's averaging over 10 meters per run, well, he's a very fast dude who runs very direct lines and attacks players. Dylan Brown, very fast, attacks players. Brandon Smith, very fast and powerful. So they're averaging 10 meters per run with speed and footwork. Same with Joey Manu. But then you've got Jesse Bromwich, Fisher Harris, Papali'i, Kitty Bromwich, Joseph Tarpany. They're all big dudes. So there are different ways to play direct, to play fast, to play um, north and south footy. And when you combine that directness with Joey Manu creeping across field, for example, or shifting it to the edges, then you're getting into well-rounded footy. But the key thing is that it starts with the halves, Dylan Brown, Jerome Hughes, and Brandon Smith. They're running the footy as much as possible, and they're very fast, and they're always straightening up the attack. That was a lot of mathematics. Even though it wasn't much mathematics, it felt like a lot of numbers and a lot of mathematics. Wild card, take us into the mangroves. Yeah, well, it's... <laughs> Even I got the calculator wrap out for that one. So there was definitely some mathematics. Um, deep in the mangroves, well, deep in the mangroves of the garage I'm sitting and I just saw a mouse run across the back wall. So there's that. <laughs> um, and then even deeper in the mangroves, 
There's a little story I want to tell here. Um, once upon a time, Ty Winyard was the best Aotearoa basketball prospect since Stephen Adams. Um, signed on to Big Dog Kentucky College. Uh, just had been dominating at Junior World Cups. Um, even still, probably can't say that anymore about him. Um, I think best prospect since Stephen Adams is now Charlie Sledger Walker. But um, so Ty Winyard was the absolute man back then. Huge hopes for what he might achieve. Um, but he only played sparingly in his first year at Kentucky and then a back injury in year two pretty much derailed him and really set back his career quite a while. He transferred to Santa Clara, but had to sit out the first year um, as, a, as a transfer. And then after that, COVID hit. So he, he came back and um, that was his college career done. He had a stint at Southland where he didn't really do a whole lot, still battling that injury. Um, then he had a defensive uh, development player role with um, Ken's Taipans in the NBL at Australia, which only led to him making one appearance. So it didn't really work out either. Um, and he wasn't back afterwards. That was then. This is now. Ty Winyard is in his third season with the Taranaki Mountain Airs and is looking as good as he ever has on a basketball court. He lost nearly 15 kgs in his offseason on water. He's, his defense has been genuinely fantastic. He's averaging 15.3 points, 9.1 rebounds, 1.1 assists, 1.8 steals, 1.1 block, and 28 minutes per night. So, it's, you know, over one in every single, all five of those major stats. He's shooting 55% from the field. Um, didn't check to see what other players have also hit those marks, but I'm guessing probably none. Um, he has actually missed the last couple of games, though. Um, the reason he's missed the last couple of games for Taranaki is because he's been at the 3x3 World Cup representing New Zealand there, where he tied for the tournament lead in blocks, um, hit two-thirds of his field goal, led the Aotearoa team in scoring as they came within one point, agonizing defeat, one point of knocking out Defending champs USA in the play-in segment, trying to qualify for the quarterfinals, um, having gotten out of their group stage is something a New Zealand team hasn't done for several um, 33 World Cups. He's had some rough years in his career, but this now, this is the Ty Winyard we've been waiting for. He's been fantastic lately. Great form, looking great shape, so much fun to watch. No gun issues or anything? uh no um i just forget about that actually that was that, i don't think that was him i think that was one of his boys brought a gun to a party at kentucky or something like that because someone had been getting into fights with someone i don't know standard uni dramas eh? <laughs> it did at the time it was a bit of a like this is my bodyguard gun carrying yeah. person so well, well you it. know it wouldn't have been ty winyard because he's not a gun toting man his uh the weapon of choice in his family is an axe Exactly. Woodchop and royalty, that guy, you know? The woodchopper. Big woodchopper. Um, yeah. <laughs> you, had a, you had a mouse running across, so we've just got mayhem out my window here, uh, breaking down. Um, deep in my mangroves wildcard, I'm going UFC or MMA because Carlos Allberg had a fantastic victory on the weekend at a UFC fight night. First round KO, I think it lasted uh, 1 minute 15 seconds. He landed 15 of 19 significant strikes. His opponent landed 3 of 4 significant strikes, which were all kicks. So his opponent basically didn't throw any punches. Carlos Allberg definitely threw some punches, and they landed on his opponent's head. First was a jab, one of the best jabs you ever see. Um, literally stunned him, put him on the back foot, and then you follow that up with a flurry. The type of jab and the type of striking that highlights City Kickboxing's excellence. Because you could kind of see Carlos Allberg processing what was happening, what his opponent was doing, and then the technique, the precision, everything about it was world class, and we know City Kickboxing are world class. So um, big up Carlos Allberg. He's got a, I think he's got a, um, let me just double check to confirm. He had a loss first up in the UFC, but I think he's got two wins now back to back. So that's good for old uh, Carlos. Yeah, he de uh, defeated Car Fabio Charant in that previous fight, but that was a decision win and Charant did nothing. So it wasn't exactly like a blockbuster Carlos Allberg showcase. But his knockout of Tafon Unchukwi definitely was a showcase of not only his ability as an MMA fighter, but also the city kickboxing um, skill set. 
which brings us to this coming weekend and we'll preview these fights in depth on our niche cast episode on thursday but it's a busy weekend for city kickboxing and aotearoa mma gina fabian is fighting on the pfl card which i believe is on saturday and she will be earlier on that card so um the pfl card i think it might start at like 9 a.m in the morning so it will be earlier on saturday morning she is fighting larissa pacheco and gina fabian won her last fight but she missed weight so now she's come back to aotearoa she got back in the ckb gym and with the uh nutritionist and the dietitians everything should be uh aligned with her best performance fighting someone who is equally as good on the pfl kind of woman's circuit as gina fabian they're both everyone's basically a couple of tiers behind the champion kayla harrison so big fight for gina fabian not only as far as like just a big highly visible fight against a decent pfl fighter but also getting back on the wagon and all that stuff after missing weight i think she's got negative points in the pfl right now because she missed weight so might want to rectify that and then we go to the ufc where we have Israel Adesanya is fighting Jared Cannonier in the uh, main event of UFC 276. And you've also got Brad Riddell fighting Jalen Turner. Uh, that is the fifth to last fight on. So that might be on the prelims, maybe, um, if you're lucky. Of course, Alexander Volkanovsky is getting his uh, third fight against Max Holloway. Volkanovsky has also been training at CKB. Uh, Brad Riddell is coming off a loss against Rafael Faziev, I think. And Jared Cannonier presents a unique, intriguing, enticing challenge to Israel Adesanya, um, just with his striking, his kickboxing. His he's quite a you know thick, stout, stocky um, fighter because he's a middleweight fighter, and he did drop down a few weight divisions to get to middleweight. So he does have that kind of frame from a bigger weight division coming down. And here's a very a fascinating uh, bloke as well, Jared Cannonier. So uh, that will be interesting. And this is about as concentrated a period of CKB as we'll get. Um, Carlos Ulberg's fight snuck, on, snuck under the radar, um, but I did remember it was happening in time to do a preview and then to tap in which was great and now we move into ufc 276 featuring israel adesanya and brad riddell from aotearoa that is on that will be on the sunday afternoon but don't sleep on gina fabian fighting on the pfl card on saturday as well question time here wildcard i've got three different topics and i just want you to go hard and fast just uh, deliver the the thoughts the ideas that pop into your mind as soon as i mention um some of these topics and try not to go like um for example i say joey manu you say roosters like try to try to <laughs> drop some some insight you know instead of just something the, yeah a uh, word association so sean marks sean marks um uh, well like I said at the start, I'm, I'm proud of the fella. I, I don't think he's got much more. He like He's in a difficult situation where he's between a rock and a hard place. Um, if he's able to, like, I think the best case scenario is that he's able to get Kyrie Irving feeling fully invested and bought in, and he's already supposedly got him to opt in to his year of a contract. I think that's their best opportunity for being successful this year rather than anything they could trade for. And... I think he's going around the right way to, to sort that out. He's been nice and firm in negotiations, but he's also been like, you know, we can work together. We'll see how this goes. So interesting few, like really, really interesting week coming up for him though. Little less uh, information, just drop some, drop some heat here. Black Caps loser. Who is the Black Caps loser from this test series? A little bit of everyone. Um, us for stay, me for staying up late a lot of times and watching it. I, I think Henry Nichols is in a little bit of strife here. Um, not just because he failed with the bat, because everyone failed with the bat in the top five, um, but 
and I do feel sorry for him because he's a guy who, whenever he struggles, people seem to forget all the good things he's done in the past. But this is a situation where I do think he's in trouble, not just because he struggled, but also because Daryl Mitchell was so good. And they don't seem to want to bowl Daryl Mitchell, which means that Daryl Mitchell can't be considered for like batting number seven or, you know, batting six above Blundell, but as an all rounder kind of thing. They got to find a place for him in there somewhere. And Henry Nichols might be the full guy if that's the case. Last question here. First thing that comes to mind, Tauihi basketball, the women's MBL has hit, is, uh, just looks a whole lot better. Looks a little bit more professional, a little bit funkier, and that is starting this week as well. Tauihi basketball. Yeah, all of those things, but I think the thing that I'm just personally quite excited to see is the, um, the, the returns of two of um, Aotearoa's, like, highest performing college basketballers, basketballers over the recent times, um, Akiri Tero reed and um, uh, Crystal Ledger-Walker, who are both playing for Northern, and like, their front court's going to be insane. Like that, Those are two extremely talented players who are going to probably be a part of Tall Fern squads for a long time to come, and this is sort of like their first big stint out of college, and I'm real, um, real pumped to see how they go. Your question? At which point I got to flip back a question, don't I? Um, let's go with this. Um, what did you learn from the return of International Rugby League on the weekend? One thing was from that uh, little stat stump that I did earlier, and is the importance of playing direct. Any rugby league team, I'd, I'd stretch it out to any other sport as well. If you can always uh, start with being direct, everything else can flow on there. So in a rugby league sense, it means halves running the footy straight. It means getting out of dummy half. It means power running straight. And that's very important rugby league right now. I also was pondering a lot about the makeup of the Kiwis and how someone like Ronaldo Molotalo entered the Kiwis camp and just seemed to really embrace Aotearoa Kiwis rugby league. Even someone like Moses Liotta, um, who was trying to play for New South Wales as late as like a year ago. And he laid everything out for Aotearoa Kiwis, like running super hard and just their mana was on display in that Aotearoa Kiwis game. And I'm trying to process, you know, big culture guys around here at the niche cage processing co culture and some of that stuff. And I think the, the takeaway, the learning there is something that I've seen across a lot of other Aotearoa sport, and it's the why. If any sporting environment, if you can fig and get players to figure out why they're playing and why they want to play well, they're going to go above and beyond. And I think that's what Michael McGuire's done with the Kiwis. I think that's a really big All Blacks thing as well. Like everyone has their why, their reason for playing, who they represent, why they represent them. And then you bring all of that together and the Kiwis team and the, the camp welcomes everyone in as if there's no drama, no niggle, and you're embraced as a, as a member of the whānau, and then you've got your own individual why. And I think the performances of all the Kiwis showed that and showed the value of the why, but especially guys like Ronaldo Molotalo and Moses Liotta, they, I think under Michael Maguire, everyone in the Kiwis has their why, and that was on display in the performances of Moses Liotta and Ronaldo Molotalo for Aotearoa. Musical jam here, Wildcard. Just want to highlight some uh, funky Aotearoa tunes. New track from Troy Kingy. He's got a song, Katipu, um, which is a super funky Te Reo Waiata. And then you've got another artist, Tikura Huia, who has some like dance hall-y Te Reo Waiata as well that is immense raise your mana music all of this is just raise your mana music that really connects you to aotearoa still in that matariki shadow so more connection to aotearoa the better your musical jam yeah i'm, I'm overseas with the jams here um new album from joan shelley sort of uh, american folk singer um loved her last record thought it's one of the best things i've heard in the last few years new one high hopes for i've heard a couple tracks sounds lovely um her music sounds like um 
it sounds like morning dew dipping off of like a, a rose petal or something like that. You know what I mean? Like it's very naturalistic and um, feels like you're getting in touch with nature and, you know, um, tapping into something um, essential there, which is always great. A band called Goose have an album out. Um, everyone seems to love Goose and like jam band circles. And I'm definitely a jam band guy, but I haven't, I haven't like adored what I've heard from them in the past so far. So I'll, I'll give this album a go and see if they're up to, up to the hype. Um, and then I, I have not listened to a lot of hip hop this year, but I did listen to the newest Conway the Machine album, and I did like that one. Um, I I saw it because it had it was popped up on Bandcamp, and I heard the first track, which was like an invocation type thing, um, like almost like a prayer thing to start it off. And I'm like that sounds cool as like I had real nice sort of like sample bed background thing going on. And then like the third track was named Bodie Broadus, which is a character from The Wire. I'm like, oh, I love The Wire. Um, I just read that oral history book about The Wire a couple months ago. So I listened to the album and the samples in particular on that one are top notch, like lots of old soul and blues type stuff. It's it's cool as. Um, so there's three albums right there that I've been either listening to or about to listen to. And it's nearly the end of the month. So we'll have our album recommendation article up. So uh, yeah, probably give us a few days to write that one, but uh, that'll be up sooner rather than later as well. So more where that came from. There was another, you just remind me, there was another hip hop track. Uh, I think Dot the Genius produced it, and it's got uh, Kid Cudi, Denzel Curry, and J.I.D. Jid uh, all spitting a verse on that as well. So that was a that was a good jam. And you coming in with a bit of, a bit of Griselda hip hop there. So you just, I've fallen off the hip hop and you've picked it up. So, so good, Mahi. One album anyway. <laughs> I think my experience is of like griselda is so productive if you get one album you like like that's kind of all you need yeah like they do have growth they are yeah like, i know a what you mean. it is more polished but it's all very similar sounding and if yeah. you get the idea you can get the gist and you can just kind of you don't necessarily need to go f way back into their discography to um find new tracks as well and if you listen to everything that comes out it, it just all like overlaps each other and then swamps itself sort of thing um there's definitely a few other like productive artists or or sort of regions or scenes or whatever we uh, get that feeling as well where it's like there's so much you kind of don't need to listen to everything because it's just going to overwhelm you if you do and you won't hear anything else you know but of course streaming era the more music you release the more money you make the more streams you play yeah. So more revenue makes. So it's uh, good for the artist to be highly productive and churn out um, repetitive, repetitive, God, repetitive, just, repetitive uh, music and uh, get the streams. And we need to finish the podcast because I'm all over the show. <laughs> Kia kaha, stay beautiful, raise your mana, Maori order, and we'll be back with a big niche cast later in the week. Chicha.